Frontend Authority is an online community that promotes the ongoing education of front-end technologies. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Chris. Uh, this is super nice. Uh, this is not me, of course. This is a beautiful visualization done by this guy who takes like MDI files and converts them into a visualization. It's just absolutely gorgeous. He does this with a lot of classical music. So just go online and turn it on. It's pretty amazing. Um, but it just gives you an idea of what you can do with visualizations. Oh, yeah. Thanks. OK, my name's Chris. And um, let's start the presentation. Uh, AJ invited me to give this talk. I've actually given this talk, a variation of it, at full stack before. So I apologize if you see these slides. And I promise you there's no code here. My brother's here, so if I were to code in front of him, he would probably heckle me and tell me I'm too slow. Uh, let's see. OK, awesome. Oops, this is the wrong one, actually. I don't want to go. OK, visualizations uh, should have a goal. Um, so you, uh, there's three cat broad categories. Record, which is blueprints, photography, uh, seismographs. Um, uh, web visualizations typically fall into the, the latter two, which is either analyze or communicate. Analyze means we're going to develop and assess a hypothesis. You want your web visualization to be explorative. And then finally, uh, sometimes you're communicating a story. Um, this is a famous visualization um, from, let's see, uh, Charles Menard, 19, uh, 1889. This is uh, quite a famous one. This is the march of the uh, Napoleon's army from uh, the Polish border to Moscow in 1812. Um, and uh, Edward Tufte, the pioneer of information design, called this one of the greatest visualizations of all time. It's because it tells a really good story. It tells the decimation of troops as the Napoleon army marched to Moscow and back. And what he's done here is he's layered it with several, uh, he's, he's encoded several bits of data for us. What's he's, what he's done here is the size here of the, the width of the, uh, the bar represents the size of the army as, as, as the soldiers die off. And you, he's, he's, he's done some really nice things here that uh, we can pull into the way we think about design work. Um, he's put these lines here to represent every time the army crosses a river. And you can see that at some points, it almost drops by 2 -third when they, two thirds when they have to cross a river. Um, and you can also see that there's a secondary chart. Secondary charts are really important in web visualizations. This is a great example of, of storytelling. He's showing us the drop in temperature. And as the temperature drops, the army gets the, the more troops are dying. So I think this is a really effective visualization. Um, uh, Here's one of the first examples of a visualization used in, uh, for uh, scientific evidence. Oops. Uh, this is uh, by John Snow. Um, this is about, back in the day, there was a big problem with cholera in, um, in London at the time. They didn't have adequate uh, sewage systems. And John Snow uh, was in the minority. He wanted to convince the scientific community that um, it was a waterborne disease. And the, um, he came up with this, these uh, big visualizations that he put together. And this was one of the biggest pieces of evidence that was able to communicate and convince the scientific community that the, um, the water pumps were actually the source of the disease. And you can see here, these are deaths per household. And they're all, this is the famous Broad Street uh, uh, pump, and you can see a lot of deaths are associated with it. Um, so this is a really important visualization. It really changed the way that uh, uh, people viewed visualizations and how you could use them in, uh, to suit science. Um, before, there was a lot of theory around doing visualizations. You would, there, it was really across the board. Um, this is a good illustration of a very real, realistic visualization done uh, of the London Underground in map 1908. Um, this is uh, before Harry Beck in introduced his novel design in 1933. So let's just look and see how it's changed over time. So visualizations are task specific. So let's see what he's done. 
So Harry Beck has, has changed the visualization on us. Um, does anybody here, uh, by the way, this is interactive. So does anybody here see any particularly interesting visualizations or visual encoding in this uh, map of the London Underground that's in, that uh, piques your interest or you can identify? Anybody? I mean, the biggest one is that the tube stations are equal distance, right? When you're under, right, you're trying to communicate information. You don't need to communicate distance when you're underground because you can't see anything. You're just in a, t but what you need to communicate is where's my next stop? How many more stops before I get to my destination? So this is a uh, really effective visualization because it takes out those dimensions that are not important. In this case, it takes out the spatial uh, dimension. Uh, why do we use visualizations? It actually has a lot to do with uh, the science around how the brain works. Uh, our cognitive ability is limited. We, use, we have very short-term memory. Um, our, when we're doing cognitive processing, we have to use a lot of short-term uh, short memory, which, which, which only allows small amounts of information to be processed. Uh, visual, when we, we use the visualization, we're taking advantage of the visual cortex. And uh, one, one interesting aspect of this is more than 50% of the brain is dedicated to the f uh, some form of visual processing, whether it's just a combination of visual processing with uh, spatial navigation or motor skills or attention to different aspects of our environment. And then of that part of that, uh, about 20% is fully dedicated to, the, to uh, actual visual, uh, performing visual tasks that require no kind of mo motor interaction or interaction with our environment. Okay, so why, um, well, why can't we use statistics? I mean, this, is, this is, uh, was done in 1978. This is Asacom's quartet, or 1973. Um, statistics don't always communicate uh, all the information that we need. So um, in this case, uh, all four of these graphs have the same variance, mean, correlation, and linear regression. So this is why we graph data. Okay, let's talk about bad visuals, visualizations. Uh, this is an entertaining one. <laughs> um, so what's wrong with this, anybody? This is uh, Apple's US market share. Uh, obviously, Steve Jobs is giving you a presentation. Anybody want to say what's wrong with this? Yeah, absolutely. 19.5% is more space than the, and, and notice how it's, uh, it's, this is not visual integrity. So your, your visualization should always have visual integrity. Okay, this is what it should look like. And, and you can tell now, uh, of course, this has changed over time, but uh, Apple doesn't have as big a share as it looks like. Okay, and this is even a better way to do it. Sometimes people get too sophisticated. For example, this is, this is off topic, but uh, donut charts are a big thing, but in visualizations, you see them used everywhere. Um, you, when, you do a vi when you do a donut chart, you're taking away information. So you should use the most simplest, most straightforward visualization that you can to communicate the ideas. Because the idea or the concept or the quantification of the data should be represented uh, more prominently than the visual style. Uh, Tufty was the, uh, one of the pioneers of visual design even before there was the web. Um, so here's three points. Uh, you sh should show data variation, not design variation. So you, sh you don't need a lot of, effect, a lot of um, flashy graphics to communi communicate ideas. You should be communicating the, the data itself. Um, good labeling. And the size of the graphics should be proportional to the num numeric quantities. Uh, Fox News is an excellent source of bad visualizations. <laughs> so. Um, anybody know what's wrong with this? It's pretty simple, but... <laughs> um, and this is actually, very, this is, happens all the time. This is, uh, this is a no-no. You always want to put your Y and your X-axis at zero. This is what it should look like. Okay, so they're trying to, they're trying to, they're basically, they don't have, they're not showing integrity in their visualization. Um, so, some design, simple design principles are you want to maximize the data density, so uh, to the total number of ink in the graphic, so you don't need a lot of junk in your graph. You just want your graph to have most, mostly all of the ink that you're seeing, or all of the pixelation should be actual data items. Uh, avoid a junk chart. You should also avoid 3D. The human brain does not work good with 3D visualizations. It doesn't communicate. It may impress people, but it doesn't actually communicate uh, uh, quantitative or qualitative data, data that well. Uh, you should layer information, and that goes to storytelling. 
Okay, this is a, an ex another example of a really bad visualization. Um, this is in 3D, so it's, there's no reason for it to be in 3D. And let me just go there. Um, so this is the Russian telecom market. Okay, this has excessive decoration, and it's using donuts. There's no reason you, with donuts, you're just taking away information out of the middle of the graph. So you can use a pie chart, but a lot of times you don't need a pie chart. You can just do stuff with a, with a simple uh, bar graph, which may be less fancy, but oftentimes it's easier to communicate uh, differences in ratios. Okay, so let's look at some good web. These are some web visualizations that, my, that have caught my, my eye over time. Um, I've got a whole bunch that I look at, so if you ever want to chat with me, there's a whole, I, I love to look at good visualizations, or if you have one you want to share, I'd love to see it. Um, this, uh, the New York Times is a great source of good visualizations. They have a dedicated uh, staff that works on visualizations. Um, this one uh, shows box office, box office receipts, and it's a stream graph, so it's showing the in area, the dimension is it's showing you area. It's showing you how many, how much money a particular movie you earned. Um, which is nice about what's nice about this in particular is that you can ignore the uh, y-axis, right? So it's really irrelevant. And the innovative part about this is the symmetrical layout is clustered around a, a single uh, horizontal axis point. But this works, right? Because your mind, your eye is, is drawn to. The area, you're looking for the area. The area is imparting the information about what movie did well at the box office. And this is also interactive. It's nice, it has that interactive element. You can actually scroll through uh, different time periods. So it also offers that explorative aspect that always makes the visualization good. This is Jock Binta's system, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, system of visual, var visual variables. So this is just a categorization of all the visual variables that you can use in your visualization. There's a lot going on here. Um, I will just draw your, uh, your attention to the fact that color is often misused. Uh, what I mean is color hue, like red, black, and blue. Uh, color hue uh, should be used for qualitative differences. Um, the same goes for uh, color intensity and shape. If you have different shapes in a graph, they're not going to communicate quantitative data. It's going to be for like categories, cars, trucks, planes, whatever it is. Okay. So this is just to show you how our, our, our visual system works. Um, anybody want to tell me how much larger B is than A? Twice, Twice right? Okay. <laughs> what about this? Right, it's, it's actually two times. So, I mean, that, that's actually showing us that um, we are better with linear shapes in terms of representational sizes or relativistic sizing. Um, and they've done lots of scientific studies over the years to actually inform you about what is the best way to encode data. The strongest, most important way to encode data is with position. So whenever you're doing a visualization, your, your most important dimension that you're showing should be the position. I mean, most, in most cases, you're going to use position to show your strongest or most important dimension in your story. Um, color and shape are the least effective. Um, and when we're talking about data visualizations, we're usually talking about quantitative data. So that's going to be very important to, to use the position and also use length if you need to. Okay, let's talk about some good visualizations. This is nice. Um, I do have some critiques on this, but um, uh, I would just like to ask you, does anybody here see any visual encoding um, variables? It, can anybody here identify what the key visual encoding variable that's used in this chart is? Height, yeah, right, position, position. So this is really cool. This is, um, uh, this is called the <laughs> headometer which is a, a measure, it's supposedly a measure of happiness. It uses the Twitter um, garden hose freeze. It looks at each garden hose API, and it basically it identifies words that are associated with happiness, and then it graphs them, um, gives them a score, and then graphs them. So you can see, based on what people are doing on Twitter, possibly how happy they are. I mean, that's the theory behind it. But it's also interactive. Um, nice thing about this, I'm not, I'm not going to go out and look at it, but it has brushing. Brushing would allow me to come down here and move my mouse. Um, 
you, you only have so much space on your screen to represent a data set, so especially if you're on a timeline, you might want to use brushing. Brushing allows you to, allows the user to kind of focus in on a certain time, date, time range, and uh, get a more uh, detailed or uh, a, de a deeper understanding of the visualization. Uh, also, this is a good use of color coding. Color coding is, allows us, to, it draws our eyes, and this also is a good use of labeling. Labels, labeling is really important for the storytelling aspect of uh, visualization. Um, this is a bad visualization. Can anybody tell me why? It's an estimate of precip. Let me give you a hint. It's an estimate of precipitation. So it's showing you how much waterfall is happening around the country. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't understand this by looking at it. You're, you're close. You're, you can't understand by looking at it because they're using the wrong uh, visual encoding system to represent the data. They're using the color hue to show us quantitative data. So they're trying to, sh so if you were going to do this correctly, you'd, you could just use a grayscale, right? That would, you would go look at the light areas for less precipitation, the dark areas for more precipitation. We can't, our brains cannot cognitively, even if we, we have to cognitively, think about this in order to actually understand it. We have to, our, we're, our eye will be popping back before, between the labels because they're actually categories. Our brain treats those as nominal categories. So our brain will be popping between the labeling system and the actual map, which is a very bad way to do visualizations. Um, let's talk a little bit about color. I, I'm assuming we're, you guys are designers here, so you probably know more than I do about color. Um, um, but I think this is one of the most fascinating parts about doing visualizations is how, how our minds work with different colors. Um, this is what we call, uh, well, first of all, did, did the red pop out to you that when you saw this right away? It really pops out, doesn't it? Um, this is what we call pre-attentive processing. It's an unconscious accumulation of information that happens before we cognitively think about it. So we actually are, we have this incredible thing that happens in our brain where we look at our environment and then we, uh, our mind actually, or not our mind, but our, our, our cortex goes ahead and it, 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 it associates information with other information that we have in our head and it processes it before we can cognitively be aware of it. So I think this is really interesting. The reason that we're, we're seeing those reds pop out is actually evolutionary. Um, uh, when we were, uh, I mean, the theory behind this is that, well, we have a lot of, first of all, we have a lot of, um, uh, uh, cone receptors for the, for the red color and green. We have the most receptors for those two colors. Uh, we think that's evolutionary because that would have, like picking a red berry would have been important when we were out gathering for food and green would have been an abundant color in nature, whereas blue was less important. Blue is just the color of the sky. So we, there's, there's, reason, there's some theory behind, evolutionary theory behind why we see certain colors come, they pop out to us. So uh, by the way, what, it, what we want to take away from this is, there's certain colors that you can use, like red uh, and green. You can use those as kind of popping colors in your visualizations to cue people to certain areas of your chart or your visualization. Um, this is a great example of it. Um, maybe we're running a little low on time here, but I just want to pop out and show you a, a great example of that that I think really illustrates good use of color. Also, um, it's interactive. Um, this is a Hungry Tech Giants. I don't know if anybody see. I, this is actually pretty popular, so you may have seen this. Okay, how do we get out? Okay, let me pop out of there. But what this does is it is highlighting, and then it's only it's all, it's actually up using up to like I think six or seven co different colors. You don't want to go over ten colors because you can't. The, we do not differentiate very easily, even though we have the ability to differentiate between ten million colors um, when we're trying to do. Uh, obtain information from our environment using colors, a color system, we're just looking for like the primary colors and a little more than that. So never do more than 10 colors in a chart. Now this is really cool because it's, uh, well, first of all, does anybody see anything innovative about this? What, there's something very innovative about this chart. Does anybody notice it? Something that you don't see typically in a visualization. Or anything, anything that pops out to you that you think is interesting or novel? Yeah, circles. 
Yeah, it's, this is really cool. They've actually, tr uh, this is really cool. This is how, you can be very creative about how you do visualization, as long as you're encoding the data in a way that uh, the, 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 the viewer can see it. They've actually encoded the, they've taken the, the y-axis, and they've, that has become no, basically uh, nominal values. And that works really effectively. So typically people would just think, oh, y and x-axis, they have to just be quantitative. But this is nominal, so I think that's really creative, and it works. Okay, let's pop out here. Okay, I just have a couple more here. Okay, let's talk about uh, high dimension data. So there's some just general rules associated with high dimension data. This is like in a category on its own. Um, there's, there's all kinds of graphing techniques that you can use for visualizations. There's basically no analytics all the way up to uh, computational analytics that go into making sure the visualization will display correctly, especially if you have large data sets. A good guide is you only want to display a maximum of, you know, like 100 dimensions and a, a maximum of 1,000 uh, data points or data records. Um, and, and even if you're going to do that amount of data, you're probably going to have to do some kind of aggregation. Um, what you'll see on the web in particular, you'll see a lot of filtering. So if you hide, have high dimension data, you want to uh, give the user the ability to filter down to the, the dimension they're interested in. Um, here's, if you were looking to do a visualization but you didn't want to uh, do some data aggregation or filtering or even use, do some machine learning, uh, you could use, this is called a parallel coordinate graph. This is, uh, shows you nutrient contents and the relationship they have between, uh, basically, you have food items, and then you're going to look at the different uh, uh, nutrient contents of those food items. And a, a parallel coordinate graph is nice because, well, I'm not, I can't click on this, but if you, were, if you were to click on one of these, you, you could see the relationship in terms of, if I click, for example, I've clicked on lard right now, it's going to show me there's a lot of fat, there's a lot of calories, and a lot of saturated fats. So you can see all the dimensions associated with fat. So that's a nice way to take, because you really, you know, you really, it's hard to get a lot of dimensions into a 2D graph. So this is one way to do it without any kind of algorithms or data aggregation. Um, if we're talking about huge data sets, uh, one technique that's co uh, common is uh, as a tree map. I'm sure you've seen these on the web. I mean, you only get so much storytelling out of a, out a tree graph. It's more just for like, hey, uh, what are some broad concepts? What are some broad things happening in my visualization? Um, this is, uh, uh, is going to show us our data in, in, in hierarchies. So you need some kind of algorithm to break out your data and organize it into hierarchies. Can anybody tell me how many hierarchies there are, what we call levels? Get, how many levels are we looking at in the tree map? Any guesses? So an algorithm ran. It took our data sets, and it said, OK, here. Everything's broken out into two levels. Guesses? Yeah, think about it for a second. Two levels of data. Yeah, well, segment or label, right, is one. I mean, so you, you basically have a financial the, the first level, the top level, is the financial technology, your, what you call the label services, and this, the final level is uh, your actual stock symbol, or your stock, your company. Um, but tree levels can go deep. <laughs> you could potentially have someone click in there, and that would bring up another tree level, which would bring you down another hierarchy. Okay. Um, I, this is going to be my last visual. This is one I did. This will be my last visualization that, that I'll sh last visualization I want to show you. Um, my the particular area of visualizations that I'm interested in, the ones that I search around for that I find interesting, are animated visualizations, which is a whole other topic. Um, and I would consider myself an amateur. I don't do this for a living, so um, um, take it for what it's worth. I'll just show you mine. Uh, let's see if I can just bring it up here. Visualizations. Okay, so let's just click on something here. Let's go to May 
what is this, May 4th, 2012. So what we're looking at is we're looking at to see, we're animating uh, the box office receipts of, of movies in that, that date range. And it's gonna just show us um, in an animated way using D3, uh, which movies did better than others. And then we can look at different dimensions. Um, but there's just a couple very simple concepts behind this one. There's brushing. So you have a secondary chart. Secondary charts are good for uh, communicating information. They also allow you to have some interaction. Um, the animation, uh, the colors, I'm, I'm using less than 10 colors, which is important. I'm using labeling. And uh, the user can click in on stuff and get a little more information. So that's just an example of, a, of an, an of, uh, and by the way, this is based off of a very famous visualization um, that is way more, <laughs> I mean, that is incredible. And if you ever, I'm sure some of you have seen it, uh, Hans Rosling's uh, health population. If you YouTube it, um, it's one of the most amazing things you'll see on the web. Um, he's a, I don't know where he's a professor, but he does this, he studies uh, world health and he kind of shows you the trend of health, the health population over the 20th century. And it's really beautiful. I don't want to steal his thunder. So if you ever get a chance, go out and look at it. But all my design is based off of what he did. So take a look at it. OK. Uh, oh, by the way, let me just go jump, just, uh, give you some uh, uh, references. Everything here that you're seeing in this presentation was distilled from a course, uh, a course at Harvard that I took. Um, I, I took it through the Extension School. It's a wonderful course, a graduate course. Uh, by um, uh, Professor Feister. There's a whole team at Harvard dedicated to the study of visualizations. And um, it's a fantastic course. Um, there's also some great resources out on the web. Here's some, I, there's plenty of really good books on it. Um, D3, this was, most of these visualizations are done in D3. Um, that's another topic. Um, but go out and just explore and enjoy yourself. And let me know if you find something really cool you want to share with me. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it'd be nice. Questions? D3. <laughs> oh, D3JS? Oh, uh, it's a JavaScript library. It's, it's, they say it's a visualization library, but it's more than that. It's a way to, to marry data with um, HTML canvases to create uh, visualizations or anything you want, really, that manipulates, has large data sets that interacts with, um, with canvases and uh, HTML5 uh, elements. Any other questions? Thank you.